Welcome to part three of our rigging tutorial. In the last part, we finished up our spine and uh, made its parameter pane. So we have a master parameter pane, spine parameter pane with some display options and our controls promoted to the uh, top level. In this video, we'll be doing the neck and head as well as the eyes. Uh, and so our our neck will have uh, two rotational controls. Our head will have a rotation control. We'll have a simple jaw. In addition, we'll have uh, this eye control, which we can move around, and we can move individual eyes if we need to. Uh, it'll also have this little uh, indicator here uh, to show where the eyes are, are looking, and you can turn that on and off. Uh, the head and eyes will also have space switching. So right now, if I rotate the neck, you can see that the head follows. But if I come over here, I can adjust this head follow parameter. So I can say right now the head is following the neck, but I can switch it to chest. And now if I rotate the neck, you can see that the head does this little sort of chicken thing, it doesn't rotate. But if I move down to the chest control, now the head moves with the chest. And then I can go down to the center of gravity. So now moving the chest, the head stays where it is. But I can come down to the center of gravity, and now it'll follow with that. And then, of course, I can go to world. Moving the center of gravity doesn't rotate the head. And the eyes will have the same thing. So right now the eye control is set to follow the head. So if I rotate the head, the eye control will move with it. But I can set that to world. And now moving the head control keeps the eyes looking straight ahead. And now with this set to world, I can come over here. I can grab our master control and I can rotate everything in the head and the eyes follow along with it. To start our rig, we're first going to come up to our type properties, and we're going to add the folder for the head and neck uh, and eyes and add their display properties. To start, we'll make a folder for our head and neck. So I'll take a folder, drop it onto the root. It'll pop it down here at the bottom. I can name that. And then since the spine um, has a bunch of parameters that we're also going to have on our head and neck, we can just shift click to select all of these. We can just hit D for duplicate. That will duplicate them all. And then with all of these still selected, I can just grab them and move them into the head and neck. Now the controls are going to be all different, so we can select all of these, just hit delete. So in our head and neck we have a display folder which again is set to simple, but we're going to change the name here to H display, get rid of that extra number at the end. Uh, our control folder is going to be H controls, and our actions folder H actions. And then for our geo display, we're going to change this to HG display for head geo display, get rid of that number. Whoops. Our bone display, similarly, HB display and controls, HC display. And then we're going to need um, a, another folder for our eyes and for our jaw. So if we think of this as the head and neck in total, we need a um, another folder at the bottom for our eyes. So we'll take that, drag it into head and neck. That goes here. We'll change this to simple. Uh, we'll call this, uh, what did we call this? Head and neck. We'll call this eyes. And then we need one for the jaw. So we'll again, drop that in there. Jaw. And then our eyes also need some display controls. Uh, because we need to control the uh, uh, visibility of the eye controls themselves. We need a uh, control for the uh, 
I follow, whether it's following the head or whether it's following the world. We need a display control for our eye line. Um, and we could also have a control for the display of the uh, eyeball proxies. So we'll take all three of these, duplicate them, drop these into our eyes, change this to EG display for EI geo display. Uh, we don't have, um, we're not going to have a toggle for our bone display. There's no real point in seeing those. Uh, so we'll just get rid of this. Our controls display will change to EC display. And then we need one for eyes follow. So we'll select one of these and duplicate it. And we'll call this E follow. eyes follow and then we need a control for the eye line so we'll take eyes follow we'll duplicate that call this uh, eye eye line and of course I always forget something and in this case that's the jaw control so we'll select our eyes control duplicate it drop it into jaw, change this to JC display for jaw control display, and that is actually it. And something that I probably should have pointed out in the last video, and I'll, I'll try to point out throughout these videos, is that when you're editing your um, operator type properties, or you're making changes inside your HDA, uh, and then you save your HIP file, what you're saving is sort of a, a temporary edit to your HDA uh, because the HDA exists in, in two states. One of them is here on disk. And if I, if I middle click, you can see that this operator is being defined by uh, the HDA in our soldier directory called soldier HDA. But because it's unlocked, I'm able to go in and make changes not only to the node network, um, but also to the uh, parameter panes up here. These changes are stored just in this HIP file. They don't exist yet in our actual HDA on disk until we apply those changes, or it, with the type properties, you can hit accept as well. And now this definition on disk is synced up to the actual contents of our HDA um, including its um, parameter pane. You can see that the changes that we made to the head and neck now appear, master spine, head, neck. And you can see that we, we now have these um, existing. And I just noticed that this jaw is set to a tab type and it should be simple type. So I can go and make that change jaw simple. But you notice that this change hasn't occurred yet because I need to apply it. And now it properly uh, in line with these. Uh, so just a note about um, the difference between uh, an unlocked HDA in a, in a HIP file and the actual definition on disk. So keep that in mind, that if you're, if you're making changes to your HDA, uh, you always want to apply those changes. So you can do that uh, through that type properties dialog, but you can also right click on an unlocked HDA and select save node type now it's synced up. And if I now match my current definition, what that will do is it will match uh, this node in this HIP file with the definition on disk. So if I make, um, so if I do that now, I'll show you match current definition. So now this is locked. And if I go inside, you can see that I can select and move stuff around, but I can't edit. I can't really make any change because it's locked out. But if I right click and say, allow editing of contents, now I've unlocked this HDA and effectively broken the link uh, in a way with its definition on disk. So now I can go in and I can just make a big torus here. So now there's a torus inside our HDA. If I go up and let's just move this guy 
let's attach this torus to our master control. Now, if I move this guy over, see he's unlocked and he's not synced up with his definition on disk. But if I add another soldier tool or digital asset, you can see that this one is locked and synced up with its definition on disk. This one has the same definition on disk, but it's unlocked. And so these changes, specifically adding a big torus, won't show up here because I haven't applied this change. But watch what happens when I do save node type. Now, both of these have a big torus in them because I've applied the changes that I've made to the definition on disk. This one has been matched to its definition, and so it will update. And if I go back and delete this, again, this definition on disk has not yet changed, even though I've changed the inside of the node. So I need to apply that change if I want to save it. And that's completely independent of saving the hip file. So now if I save the node type, you can see that our other instance, which is locked, has been updated. So keep that in mind. Now we can start actually rigging our head and neck. So currently we have our proxy for our spine displayed. So I'm going to go to the spine, turn off that proxy. And I'm also going to turn off the controls temporarily. I'm going to bring back the display of our soldier body. And I'm going to go into the side viewport and actually bring back our spine display of bones. Turn that on. So we're going to be making uh, two neck bones and then a head bone and then a jaw bone. And we'll use, use our head as a guide and we'll start at the top of the existing spine bone. So invoke our bones tool and up in the chain name, we're going to use neck, no kinematics, and the placement is going to be freehand because we're, we're in an orthographic viewport. And we'll just start right about here. So we have one neck bone to there, the next neck bone to here. We can move away, right click, finish drawing. Now in our network, we can see we have a neck root one, neck bone one, neck bone two. And I'm going to rename this neck root. And then I'm going to continue from this neck bone. And remember, uh, because of these little blue selector things, I want to use the B key. So that temporarily disables that and, and allows me to start a bone right here. So this is our head bone. And I think while I'm in this tool, I can change this to head. I think this will work. So I'm just going to go generally straight up. Uh, you can be forward or backward. It doesn't really matter. Uh, and go there, right click, finish drawing. Then it did work. So now we have a head root and head bone one. I'm going to take the one off of the root. And now we're still in our bones tool. And I'm going to say jaw. And then I'm going to make the jaw starting right right about here. Usually, I go right where the um, the earlobe, you know, meets the uh, the head, somewhere in in this general area. And we can adjust this later, just to the tip of the jaw. There we go. We have a jaw root. I'll take that off, and hit escape in the viewport to get out of the bones tool. All right now. I don't really need this head root, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to select that bone. I'm going to keep position when parenting, and then I'm going to reparent the head bone to the neck bone too. And I can get rid of that. So now I just have a simple three bone chain. And then the, the jaw root, I'm going to parent uh, to the head bone. And because the jaw root has keep position when parenting, it's going to maintain its spot right here. It's not going to snap over to the base of the jaw of the head bone. And that's that. And now, just like we did with our spine, 
uh, I'm going to go into the soldier body and make some groups for the neck uh, and the head and the jaw. And I'll come back and show you what I've done uh, when I'm finished. All right. Um, what I did was, uh, just like with the spine, um, I made uh, a geometry object for each of the bones. Uh, I colored them purple and gave them a name that makes sense for, um, for this rig. So for neck bone one, I made uh, a neck zero proxy. I could have done neck one proxy and neck, neck two proxy, but in this case, I just started with zero for some reason. Uh, and inside that, uh, our object merge, again, I went out and found the soldier body, and then I specified the group that I made. So if we go over to the soldier body, you can see that here were our spine groups that we made. Um, and then I made neck groups. So neck one, neck two, I made a group for the jaw, and then the rest is for the head. And then with this guy uh, displayed, that will allow these um, object merge uh, SOPs to be able to, to see all of those groups. So in this case, I just selected neck one. Then I put an out node, and then I'm going to control and click to lock it. And again, we'll deal with this in a better way um, later on. But now I can just go in, lock that one, lock that one, lock our jaw. And now if I go up here and I turn off the display of that original soldier mesh, Oh, wait a minute. What have I done? Something's wrong here. Oh, there's our jaw. Lock that again. And where's this guy? There we go. So when you're object merging and locking, it's easy to accidentally lock one of them and then go and change your object merge. But of course, it won't show up because you have this locked. So just unlock it. Make sure your object merge is what you want it to be, and then just relock that node. Now we go up, and now if I grab these three bones and just rotate them, you can see that we have proxy geometry, just like our spine. Uh, and so next we'll make our controls. Before we make our controls, this is a, an opportune time to test out our lock all shelf button that we made uh, because each of these proxy objects has a full transform but uh, we don't want this stuff to transform at all so i'm going to select all four of these guys i'm going to come up to my lock all shelf tool and click lock all and you can see for each one of these it's gone through and just locked all these parameters so i don't have to do that by hand so awesome the controls for our neck, head, and jaw uh, are just going to be simple rotational controls, and they're going to um, be at the root of each of these bones. So for this, we're going to use our FK control shelf tool. And so we're going to select neck bone one. FK control is going to bring up a dialog asking us for a prefix. Prefix in this case is auto filled to be the selected object, and this is fine. So I'm going to hit OK. That's going to give me three nodes. Bring these out a little bit. So we've got three nulls that are parented to each other. First is an offset, which is empty because we don't need to see anything. Uh, and this offset is going to uh, be the location of this control. This next one is called auto. And again, it's empty. And we'll use this auto um, not all the time, and in this case, not for our neck and head, but for our fingers and things like that. Uh, we'll use it to, to populate these uh, transforms with um, uh, expressions, things like curling of the fingers and fanning of the fingers. We'll do that stuff in this auto node. And that will free up this actual control for uh, animator interaction. Uh, and so this is a, an actual null that has a control object in, or a SOP inside. Uh, it's colored green, it's selectable, and it's displayed. So right now, this is positioned right at the root of our neck one bone. That's where we want. It's really big right now, but we'll fix that in a second. But this, uh, these three nodes can be thought of as a single unit, a little control unit. And it's going to be parented 
under the chest IK. So if we bring back our uh, spine controls, if we look at this guy, when we rotate our chest control, that neck control is going to come along for the ride. So I'll do the other ones for neck bone 2. Again, the prefix is filled in for us. Oops. Head bone. And the jaw. So now we have these three little sets of controls. And uh, we're just going to be parenting them in order because their positions have been set by our shelf tool to be at the root of each of the successive bones. So neck bone two offset is going to be a child of neck bone one control. Head bone offset is going to be a child of neck bone two control. And the jaw bone offset is going to be a child of the head bone control. So let's just arrange these a little bit better. If you select some nodes, and then with your mouse over one of them, you can use the A key, and you'll get this little, little grid type thing. And if you drag down, that'll just align these nodes nicely. So I can, whoops, want to make sure you're selecting the right stuff. So with those selected, these selected, now they're nicely aligned. So I'm going to grab all three of our controls. And you can see that they're defaulting to a, a one unit uh, size. So I'm going to come to the miscellaneous tab. I'm just going to drop that size down quite a bit. Let's say 0.5 for now. Uh, so our neck bone one control, eh, we can probably leave it at this size. Neck bone two could probably be a little smaller. Say four or five. There, four. Um, Head bone control could probably be a little bit bigger. And then our jaw, we want this quite a bit smaller, maybe even 10.1. But we don't want it to be at the center of our head. It's a little bit awkward to try and, to try and select inside there. Um, but we want the uh, pivot point of our jaw to be right here. So what we can do is... We can select our jaw control, and on the Transform tab, we can middle-click in its Z parameter, and just move it out. Let's see, 0.12 is probably fine. So it's gone negative 0.12 in the Z direction, but we want our pivot to go back to the root of that bone. So we can take that value, 0.12, and we can put it into our pivot translate. So you can see that that put the pivot back at the root of the bone. So now when we select here, we're getting this control. So we have our control objects, and we can rotate them. But they're not doing anything. So we want them to drive our bones. And the way that we're going to do that is with a constraint. So we select uh, the bone object, the thing we want to drive come up to the constraints shelf and our blend constraint. And whatever it's set to here, we want to set it to simple. We don't care about translation or scale. And we're going to do a keep position after. So we've selected the thing that is going to be constrained. And now we want to select the target of our constraint, which is the, the driver. Uh, and you can see that down at the status bar here, I have select or uh, now select target objects. Uh, you may have that prompt at the bottom of your viewport, but I've moved those prompts to the status bar. So in this case, neck bone one is going to be driven by uh, neck bone one control, and you can select that either in the viewport or in the network, like that, and then right click, accept selection, and this is going to drop you down uh, into that neck bone one into a constraints network. And here is the constraint that we've just built. So in this case, for neck bone one, we've 
grabbed its world space. And then we've grabbed a transform of neckbone one control and we're blending them. It's uh, a value of one, so that means full control. We're blending the rotation. And then we have this little offset here, which will just, uh, in this case, it's not all that important, but if these uh, two things were, were offset in space, if this control uh, were over here and our bone was here, uh, this offset would maintain that difference. In this case, they're in the same location, so it's not, it's not essential to have this. I just like doing it. So I'm gonna go up, up. So now on our bone, you'll notice that we have this green uh, little icon with a little wave through it. That's to indicate that we have a constraint on this node. And then you can see we have enable constraints and then the path to the constraint network. If we follow that, you can see that we're inside the bone object and there is that network that we just looked at. So coming back up, we can select our neck bone one. And now when we rotate it, we'll see that that bone rotates as well. So now we'll just continue uh, for the other bones, neck bone two, uh, constraint, blend, it's still set to simple, still set to rotation, still set to after. Now I can select uh, neck bone two control, accept selection, drops me into this constraints network. Everything looks okay. Come back up, head bone, constraint, blend, everything is the same. Select the head bone control, accept selection, pops me into this network. Everything looks fine. Back up to soldier. Now I can do jawbone. I can do blend, everything looks the same. Now I can select the little jaw control, accept selection, and there we go. Now if we select our jaw rotation, you can see that it's rotating our jawbone, and that's bringing the proxy geometry along with it. The same for the head bone, neck two, and the first one we did. So our head rig is essentially done. We have uh, rotation control of all of our uh, of all of our bones. We can move our jaw. Uh, so before we finish it up, let's start promoting some of our parameters. So we open up our type properties. We can see that we inside our head neck we have display, we have controls, actions, we have the eyes and the jaw that we'll get to in a second. Um, let's just quickly promote our jaw control. So our jaw control selected. Um, we've got this translate Z and pivot rotate in Z, and that was to move the position of the control from the root here up to the tip of the bone. Uh, we can just do a quick clean transform. And I think the pivot rotate or pivot uh, parameters stay that way. Um, but what we want to do is promote this rotate parameter. So let's grab that drop it on jaw, and it's by default called R2, but we don't want that. We want jaw rote. We want jaw rotate. We can hit apply and accept, so we can see now that that has a, um, a relative reference to our parameters. And here it is. And we also want to lock all this stuff off. So again, we can use our uh, rigging menu, rigging shelf, uh, lock all control. So job on one control selected, lock all, locks everything, but leaves this rotation alone. So that's it for our jaw control. Uh, now we want to do uh, the neck, the two neck controls uh, and the head control. And then we want to add um, the controls to determine uh, the space in which this head will rotate. So first, again in our type properties, we're going to add the controls into the head and neck. So 
uh, neck bone one control. I'm going to add the rotate. Neck bone two control, add the rotate. Head bone one control, add the rotate. And now we want to rename these. Two rot. So neck one rot, neck two rot, head rot. Apply and accept. Now we can see that these have been promoted. And again, we'll uh, grab these three and use our lock all. Let's lock them all. And next we'll do our space switching. The concept behind space switching uh, is simply giving a control the ability to exist in different rotational spaces. Uh, and the way that we can do that uh, is very simple. We can create a null and we can call it head follows neck or location. And then we can make that a child of the head bone control like that. And then we can keep position when parenting and we can break that connection. And now this uh, control will be a child of another uh, rotational space. In this case, um, neck bone two control, but its location is going to be at the root of the head. So when we change the parenting of the head bone, uh, actually it'll be neck bone one, I think. Um, when we change the parent, uh, the position of the head won't change, but where it rotates from will change. So we can also do this if we copy and paste. We can say head follows neck location. Copy paste. Head follows center of gravity. Paste again. Head follows world location. Now with these locations defined, we can parent them uh, to their respective uh, rotations. So head follows neck location. It's going to follow uh, neck bone one. Head follow chest location is going to follow chest control, chest IK control, I should say. Um, head follows center of gravity location is going to be child of the cog. And head follows world is going to be a child of the master control. Now we can take these four, we can turn off their selectability, turn off their visibility, and just kind of move them over here a little bit. And now what we want to do is we want to drive the head bone one auto. And we're going to use, again, a constraint for that. But this time we're not going to use the blend constraint, we're going to use the parent blend constraint. So we can click parent blend. And again, at the uh, status bar, yours again might be at the bottom of the viewport, but mine says select, ob select object to create parent blend constraint. So that object is head bone one auto. So I'm going to select that and in the viewport, uh, accept selection, or you can use enter. And now it says, now select new parent objects. So I'm going to select head follows neck, follows chest, follows cog, follows world. I'm going to right click and accept. And that dumps me uh, into our head bone one auto into the constraints network that's been built for us. And this is very much like the other constraint um, with just some slight differences. So again, we're getting the world space of our constrained object. We're getting its parent space of the constrained object. So that's the actual parent of the constrained object. Then we're getting the locations of the head follows neck location, cog or chest uh, location, cog, and world. And all of these are being fed into a blend. And right now they're all set to one, but we'll change that in a second. And then the result of that is sent out as the transform of that object. So we don't want all of these to be on at the same time, and we certainly don't want to have to 
make our animator come all the way into this network and, and mess around with this stuff. So we're going to drive these with an, a simple expression. So if I open up my parameter pane for the, for the head and neck, you can see we have this head space control. And this is going to send a number out. So if it's set to neck, the number is going to be zero. Chest is going to be one. Cog is going to be two. World is going to be three. So we can use uh, an evaluation of that to determine what these should be. So the easy way to set that up is to take the headspace parameter, just drag it into this first, uh, the second slot here. The first slot is for our network parent, and the next slot is for the neck. And right now this headspace is set to neck. So I'm going to drag that and drop the relative channel reference right here. We can see that this blend is being determined by the value that's coming back from this parameter. So if I toggle this to its evaluation mode, you have a zero because that's zero. But if I change this to world, you can see that that is now a three. So how does that help us? Well, if we change this back, what we want to do is not simply evaluate this. What we want to do is get this value and then make a decision based on what that value is. So I'm going to extend this out a little bit. What we can do is write a very simple expression. If, open parentheses, so if this value, evaluated from the parameter pane, is equal to, and equal to here is double equals, if it is equal to zero, which is right now what our neck value is, so if this is equal to zero, then the value that this parameter should now have is one. Otherwise, if it is anything but zero, this parameter should be zero. And we can end the, the if statement with that parentheses. So again, if headspace, which is this guy here, is equal to zero and only zero, then this entire parameter should evaluate to one. If it's something other than zero, this entire parameter should evaluate to zero. So now I can take that, I copy it, but if we go back to its um, evaluation mode, we can see that this parameter is sending the value of zero to anyone who is listening. And this guy's hearing that, putting that value here, comparing it to this zero and saying, yep, they're equal. So this parameter should be one. And we can see that it is in fact one. But if I change it to chest, this is a one that is being sent from this headspace parameter. So one is not equal to zero. So this parameter is going to be zero. So now we can use that for all of these. So again, I can take this, copy it, put it here. And this one is for our chest. So it's actually a one that is being sent by this parameter. So if headspace equals one, then this should be one, otherwise zero. And here, this should be compared to the value of two, because that's zero, one, two, cog. And finally, the world is a three. So now, if three is being sent by headspace, these should be zero, and they are, and this one should be one. And so that's swapping the parent between these four um, objects. And we can test that. If we go up and up again. So again, we're, we're telling this headbone one auto where it's uh, space is for its rotation. So let's bring up our parameters. Let's pull that over there. So right now, our head is in the parent space of the neck. So I can rotate my head independently. This guy is rotating, but it's not rotating the head. You can see that the head is keeping straight. But if I go down to neck one, 
and rotate it, you can see that the head is rotating with neck one. If I go down to the chest, it's also rotating, but it's not rotating because its parent is the chest. It's rotating because the neck is a direct parent or a direct child of the chest. But if I change this to chest, again, this one doesn't rotate the head. This neck one doesn't rotate the head, but now the chest does rotate the head. And then we can test the cog. So if, if the cog um, is our parent of our head rotation, now rotating the chest does not rotate the head, but our cog does. And if we go down to the world, our chest again doesn't rotate the head, but it does rotate with the world. And we're, something's wrong there. I'll fix that in a second. But you can see that using this control, we can determine uh, the space in which the head rotates. In testing the uh, head rotation, I noticed that if we set that to world, and select our master control and rotate, uh, the head is rotating with the world, but the whole neck and head isn't moving with the spine. And the reason is that, as always, I've forgotten something, and that is that this neck root needs to be constrained so that it will follow the spine. So we'll do that next. To ensure that our uh, neck and head bones move with our controls, we're going to constrain the neck root to this neck bone one control. So we're going to select that. We're going to go simple blend, turn on everything. Uh, key position after is fine. And now we can select that control, accept selection. And now, with our, if we rotate master control, everything follows along just fine. Here's our cog. If we set that to chest, head rotates with cog and with the chest. Set this to cog. The head doesn't rotate. Before we move on to our eyes, uh, let's just do a little bit of cleanup here in our network. Uh, all of these guys, we want to lock their transforms. And in addition, all of these autos, we want to lock their transform, including this head bone auto that has the constraint. So we're going to grab all those and we'll come to our rigging shelf, lock all. And then the neck root. We don't need to be able to select it. We don't need to see it. And we want to lock it. Let's just see our jaw root. Don't need to see that or select it. And we want to lock it. And all of these, we don't need to see them or select them. And we also want to lock them. So there is our neck and head rig done, and next we'll move on uh, to the eyes. Our eye rig is fairly straightforward. We're going to have a bone for each eye, and then parented under that bone is going to be a piece of proxy geometry, and then each of those bones is going to be constrained with a look-at constraint uh, to one of these uh, little eye look-at nulls, and then these look-at nulls are going to be the children of a master control to move both eyes around at the same time. This master control will also have a, uh, an eyes follow parameter. So in this case, it's following the head. So if I rotate the head, that look at will follow. Or I can switch it to world, in which case the eyes will remain looking at that look at control no matter where I put the head. You can get this kind of thing going on. To start, I've gone in and um, made groups of the eyes. And actually, to be honest, I stole these eyes from our test geometry Tommy character. That's why it's got some textures on them. 
And what we're going to do is uh, snap a null with a bone uh, to the center of this left eye. So to start, I've uh, used the same technique that we did with the jaw and the rest of the head uh, and created a left eye proxy and a right eye proxy, locked off their controls. And inside, uh, again, object merged, locked. And just here on the left eye, I've added a sphere with the object merge as its input. It's just a primitive sphere. And what that will do is the dimensions of the sphere will be inherited from the, the size of whatever's coming in. Uh, so now we have this sphere uh, centered right on the eye geometry. And now if I go up to the object level and throw down a null, we can use this centroid expression. Um, so in this case, I'm asking for the centroid of what object, the left eye proxy, and then I'm looking for the dimension in X. And if I put that in, it'll give me this little value. So now this null, which is currently down there by the origin, has shifted over that amount. So then I can take this tab over to the Y, dimension in the Y, and see that it's hopped up. And again for Z. And now that null is right in the center of that sphere. I can make the display geometry much smaller. And so now this null is at the right location for this left eye. I'm going to call this left eye root. And I'm going to make a bone, not uh, in the viewport with the bones tool, but just create a bone here in the network and parent that to the eye, sorry, the eye root. <clears throat> now you'll see that it's a uh, default of one unit, uh, which is one meter, uh, and it's pointing in, uh, in Z here. So what I can do, the eye root, throw that to 180, then on the bone, I'm going to make it much smaller, and it's just going to poke just out the front of the eye. Uh, and we're not going to be doing any um, sort of capturing with this bone. We're just using it uh, as an indicator. Whoops. So I'm just going to poke it out just that much, uh, it's purely for, for visualization. And then I'm going to call this left eye bone. And now that we're doing things on our, on our left side, like all this time we've been doing things in the center uh, for our spine and our head and neck, and the naming conventions we've been using uh, haven't involved any left or right nomenclature because we're not going to be mirroring any of this stuff. But now, <clears throat> with the eyes, or starting with the eyes, we're going to be doing things on our left side and then mirroring what we've done over to the right side. So the naming convention is going to become very important uh, because the mirror tool here at the object level, level um, is very smart provided it's given the right kind of names. So we'll see that uh, right now. Now in the left eye proxy, I can get rid of the sphere, put the display back <clears throat> on the out node. So there's our eye. There's our eye root null and our eye bone. And I'm going to parent the left eye proxy under the left eye bone. So now when we rotate this null or the, uh, the bone, the eye will rotate in the head. So I'm going to turn off selectability and uh, display of the left eye root. I'm going to delete the channel on translate, and that will leave the values. Then I'm going to grab that, just do a clean transform, and then I'm going to use our shelf tool, lock all, because we're going to be moving, moving the eye with the bone and not the null. So with these two selected, I now want to mirror them over to the right-hand side. And to do that, I'm going to use the mirror tool. So in the viewport, I'm just going to type mirror. And um, at the bottom here in my status bar, it says select one or more objects, then press enter to continue. But I'm going to select in the network and accept. And it mirrored the right eye and the left eye, or the eye root and the bone. So I'll do that again, because I want to show you, let's just get rid of this stuff for a second. We'll turn off the 
those bones. Turn that off. So when you use the mirror tool up here at the top, uh, it'll ask you what new prefix you want. And in this case, I'm using R underscore, and that's going to replace this left underscore. And so that's why this naming convention is very important. You want something, um, you want a prefix on your, your nodes uh, that makes sense and also uh, accommodates this usage here. So it's going to give me a new prefix. It's going to remove the old name up to underscore. So it's going to remove that. I'm mirroring on the YZ plane. And now when I select these guys, you can see that I'm getting, I get this little preview of the new nodes that I'm about to create. So it's, it's not showing me the, uh, the uh, null because I've hidden it, but it is showing me the new bone that's going to be created. And this is very helpful because if, if this were showing up over here somewhere, I would know that I, I need to look at what my mirror plane is and, and what's going on. But here it's showing me that it's going to mirror to the right-hand side. So again, accept selection. And now we have a right eye root and a right eye bone. We can turn that on, let's see. And so they're named correctly. They're in the, the right space uh, and everything is good. So now I can take this right eye proxy, turn it back on and mirror it to that. Whoops, what have I done here? Ah, I don't have keep position when parenting on. So I'll unparent that, keep position when parenting parent it to the bone. And turn that off. Now that we've done that, rearrange this a little bit. And we're going to parent both of these roots uh, to the head bone. So we can select both, parent to the head bone. Whoops. Keep position when parenting. We can turn this back on. So now when we rotate our head, our eyes are going to follow. But we also want these two bones to look at some kind of control out here. And so we're going to make three controls, one for each eye individually, and then one control for both collectively. So again, we're going to use our FK control. Oops do die root. So this control is going to be the left eye control uh, look at. So I'm going to say left eye as the prefix. And so here I get left eye offset, left eye auto, and left eye control. I'll do the same for the right eye. So right eye is our prefix. And we get right eye offset, right eye auto, and right eye control. And right now, these are big giant spheres or circles at the position of the eye. So I'm going to take both of these, I'm going to change them to nulls, and I'm going to make their size quite small, something like that. So right now, these are at the position of the eye, but we want them to be somewhere out here. And this is really up to you and, and your character. Uh, but so I'm going to take both of the left eye and right eye offset, and I'm going to translate them. Yeah, something like that is fine. Uh, it really doesn't matter. Um, you don't want to put them out to the left or right. You just want to move them out in Z. And whatever you, you think is, is good for your character. And so with these two selected, I'm going to clean that transform. So that's the position of our eyes. Um, if we had any uh, constraints or scripts or something we could put on, on the auto controls, and then the right eye control and left eye control um, are going to be for our individual animation. So now we need a third control, and that will be a parent of both of these. So in this case, I'm just going to take this right eye offset just to give me something to make a control with. And this one is going to be called eyes. And now I can click that. So now I get an eyes plural offset, eyes auto and eyes control. Take that and put it up here. 
And right now it's centered on that right eye offset because that's the one that I had selected. But we actually want it to be dead center in between the two of these. So I'm going to take this offset control and I'm going to go to the, its, its pre-transform here and say extract pre-transform. So you can see this is the, the location that it needs to be to be here. But I want it to be 0 and x. So that places it right dead center. And then the control itself, I'm going to say planes, and it's um, on the xy plane, and then I'm just going to make it small like that. Use the display scale to do that, not the uh, transform scale. So now I have a little sort of box thing that the animator can grab, and that will move both of these. So with right eye offset, keep position when parenting, left eye offset, keep position when parenting. I'm going to take both of these, make them a child of the eyes control. So now when I select that, I can move both of these around. And actually, before I do that, let me cut that. Let's just fix this uh, orientation. Extract that pre transform 180 clean that transform. So now this is oriented properly. And parent those to that. So now this guy is going to move both of those individual controls. So now what we want to do is we want to constrain the right eye and the left eye to their respective individual controls. And we'll do that uh, with a constraint. So left eye bone, go to our constraints. We're going to use the look at constraint. So when I, uh, when I click that, it, it knows that I had selected the left eye bone. So now in the status bar, it says, now select look at object, if any. And in this case, the look at object is that guy. I'm going to hit accept selection. Now I'm prompted to select a look up object, if any, and press enter. Don't have a look up object, so I'm just going to press enter. And now it's given me uh, a simple cons look at constraint. So now if I go up and up, we can see that that bone has a constraint on it. And if I move the left eye control, you can watch this left eye. So that left eye now moves. And it will move when I drag both of these. So we'll do the same to the right eye. Select the bone, select the look at, select the look at target, enter to accept, enter to accept, and now, whoops, got a little reversal of our eye. We can go into our constraint and we can say, see positive. And now both of these eyes follow along. We'll take this left eye control and we'll leave it as green. The right eye will make red, just so we can distinguish them here. And this guy will make blue. It's nice to differentiate your left and right with colors and then have another color for uh, sort of more central things. We can do that later to our spine and, and head. So next, we'll do the space switching for this control. Just as we did with our head control, uh, when we put a constraint on the auto null, uh, we'll do the same for our eyes auto here. First, we're going to make a couple of nulls. We're going to call this, and I can alt, click, and drag to create a new one. Eyes follow world location. Right now, these two are down here at the origin. I want their location to be here at this main control, so I'm going to select both. Uh, and they don't have key position when parenting on, so they snap to this new location. Now, both selected, I'm going to turn on key position when parenting. And I can break that connection. And now, this guy is going to get a constraint to both of these. So 
with the eyes auto selected. I'm going to go to my constraints shelf, parent blend, simple, full transform, keep position, and down the status bar it's saying select object to create parent blend constraint. So that's this guy. I can accept. Now select new parent objects. So that's the eyes follow head location, eyes follow world location. Right click, accept selection. So again, it dumps us into the, um, the object that we've constrained into its constraints network. So we have a get world space, we have its get parent space, eyes follow head, eyes follow world, those three are being blended. Uh, and right now, all of them are fully on, but we want to reuse that same expression that we used for the head control. So we can go in and remind ourselves what that looked like. So we were getting a value and comparing it. We'll take that. We'll reuse it here on this blend. Uh, and this time, we want to use the eyes follow parameter, which we should actually change the, uh, the wording here. We'll go back and fix that. Uh, but for now, we can still use this parameter. So I can paste that expression in. So now it's still looking at headspace. But now if I mouse over eyes follow, you'll see E follow. So I want to change this to E follow. So if eyes follow is equal to zero, which would be uh, that one, uh, then it should be one, otherwise zero. And otherwise is one, otherwise zero. So this works if we, right now our eyes follow is on one, so it does work. We change that to zero, okay, switch. Um, but our wording here is wrong. So let's change that real quick. We go to our type properties, go down to our eyes, we have our eyes follow parameter, uh, and we're using a menu, but um, our token and label are wrong. So our token's okay, zero and one, but our label is incorrect. So zero should be head, and one should be world. Hit accept. Um, and if you get this little warning, this is essentially saying that there's a path to, to a node that's unresolved. You can just hit okay, but Keep, keep a, an eye on this. So we're going to go down into constraint path constraints and see what's going on. And I think, I think it might be this is wrong. What does that say? You follow, it should be right. To test that, I'm going to grab this eyes follow parameter and drop it into this blend zero just to see what I get. So relative reference. Yeah, so that should be fine. So now I'm going to break this delete channel that back to one. I think we're okay. So if we look at the values we're getting here, if we're on head, one, if we're on world, it switches. I should actually change the default of this as well. So we'll go down to eyes, eyes follow. We made this correction. Now we can go to channels. Let's see the default value here is one, but we want that to be zero. We'll hit accept again. Getting this warning again. I'll try and find out why that's happening. I don't think it's causing any problem. So now we head back up. We can take these two nulls. We can turn off their selectability, turn off their display. And we want the eyes follow head to be parented to the head control. Head bone one control. And then the eyes follow world to be parented to our master control. So let's test and see if this works. So right now, the eyes are following the head. So if I rotate the head, this blue control should move and that will move the two inner controls. And sure enough, it does work. Now if I change this to world, so nothing changes, but when I rotate the head, 
can see that the eyes, ooh, looking over there, ooh, looking over there. So you get this sort of creepy look. So that works fine. We can go in and select these bones. We can turn off their selectability and their visibility. These roots have been locked off, that's good. Proxies are locked off. Eye offset. Uh, we can leave this stuff alone, or we could clean the transform. Either way, we're going to lock it. We'll go back to our rigging shelf, lock all. Our eyes auto. Again, we're going to lock that. Eyes control. We need to promote uh, the transform of this. Uh, right eye offset should be locked. Eyes auto should be locked. And the, oops, the right eye control, we're going to promote the translate and the translate on the left. So let's do that now. Go back to our type properties. So here, head, neck, we have eyes. So now we have these display options. So we need a little folder for our controls. So we'll add that, this. Again, that's a simple tab. We're going to call that controls. And then we want our master eye control. We want the translate of that. We call that. And then we have left eye control. And right eye. So we have an eyes control. Um, we have a left eye control and a right eye control. Hit accept. So now on these nodes, we have our translate is promoted, but we want to lock everything else. Right eye control, translate's promoted, but we want to lock everything else. Left eye, lock everything else. And there is our, our eye control. Before we finish with our eyes, we need to set up the, uh, the display properties to drive the visibility and selectability of the stuff. So right off the top, we have geo display, and our default is proxy. So again, we want to drive this depending on what kind of geometry we're showing. And we can steal that right from here select the jaw proxy, we can grab this expression that we did. Uh, and we can drop that right into those eyes. Again, render tab, display. And then you can see that this one is EG display for eyes uh, geo display. So we can change that H to an E. And now we can uh, turn the geo display off for our eyes and proxy. And then if we have um, uh, high resolution eyes, maybe for our, our deformed geometry, we can have the proxy geometry disappear. So proxy by default. And then we have the controls display off and on. Uh, we can grab all three of these, go to their render tab, turn on the display parameter drag the controls display, drop it right in there, relative channel reference. So now we have that guy, and we can turn all of those off or on. Uh, we've done our eyes follow. Uh, and next we'll do uh, this eye line. Uh, we'll build the geometry that will make that little dotted line, and then set up the control to turn that off and on. To build our eye line, we're going to measure the distance between the root of our eye and our little eye control. And then we're going to make a polygon line of that length. And then we're going to break it up so that even when this thing moves, that length will be recalculated and our, our line will update. So if we go inside of our left eye control, and I've turned on points so we can see what's going on a little bit better. What we want to do is we want to merge 
some new piece of geometry in with this control object. And then using this eye line control, we're going to drive a switch. And we're going to switch between um, when the eye line is off, and that should be the default. Let's just change that really quickly. Eye line, channels, default is zero. So when the eye line is off, this switch is going to use input zero. And we can hook this up right now. Relative channel reference. So the eye line is off, the switch is zero. Eye line is on, the switch is one. So we're going to switch between just using the regular control uh, SOP and whatever comes into this merge. And the merge is going to be the original control SOP plus the little line that we're going to make. So to make this line, I'm going to use, oops, we're going to object merge our, uh, the point that is inside the null of our I root. So in this case, that's going to be Where's our I root? I root point one export relative path. And we're going to transform it into this object. So now you can see, put on point numbers. You can sort of see it right there. So that's the merged point from the, the root null of our I. So now that we have that, we can use another merge and merge these two whoops, not that one, this point and this point together. And let's hide other objects. So now we have this point, which again was from our I root. And we have this point, which is from our I control. And then we want to just make a line between them. And the easiest way to do that is with an add SOP. So in this SOP, we have two points throw it into an add SOP, and we can say polygons by group. You can see immediately we now have this, this line. Now we're going to resample that line. And by default, um, you can see that the line's been resampled using a maximum segment length. But we're going to turn that off. We're going to turn on maximum segments. And uh, the difference here is that the, this length will accept a float value, but maximum segments is expecting um, an integer. So if we measure this, um, if we measure this curve, this line with um, with arc length, we're probably going to get a float. So we're going to have to probably multiply this up into uh, into an integer, or at least something that can be rounded to a, an integer. So we use the arc length expression just as we did with our spine. And the SOP we want is in this network, and it's that add one, primitive zero, from zero to one. And then we're going to multiply it by, let's say, 30. And so now we get our segments. And if I turn on ghost other objects, uh, this control here is we're measuring the distance between uh, this one and the eye. I'm going to move this master control, and you'll see that as I do, the line increases its length, and then also the segments increase. So the segments try and maintain their size, no matter how long this curve is. So we're going to use that with another add SOP. And in this one, we're going to delete the geometry, but we're going to keep the points. So we had geometry from the add SOP, then we subdivided it uh, with the resample. So that gave us the right points. Now we want to get rid of those points and then make new polygons by going over to the polygon tab by group. But we're not going to use all points like we did in this first add. We're going to use groups of n points. And by default, that's set to two. And that's exactly what we want. So now we have 
uh, a little dashed line that each of those dashes will maintain their size no matter how long that line becomes. And if you want these to be a little smaller, you can just multiply that arc length by a higher number. Oops, that's a really high number. Let's try 35. So that's a little smaller. Let's try 50. That's smaller again. Uh, and this is this network is very fast, so you don't really have to worry about any kind of speed hit for this. So we'll turn off point numbers. We'll turn off the display of points. Now we have our line. So coming back to what we originally had, we have our original control, which is this guy here. And now we've built this new line, whoops, uh, using uh, the point in this control and the point coming from the I root. So we have this dashed line and we want to merge those two together. So now we have the null that has an attached line. And then we want to drive what to display with this switch. And as you can see, we have the I line is off, I line is on. So what we can do is we can take all of this and we can copy it. We can go over to the right eye, make some room, paste it. You can see that everything hooked up again because uh, the names of these SOPs in our right eye control are the same as they were in the left eye control. So everything found the things that it was hooked up to before. So all we have to change is this object merge, because right now this is bringing in the left eye root, but we want the right eye root. So right eye root, and our eye line is still driving this switch, so we can turn on and turn off. So if we go back up to the object level, we can turn them on, grab that, we can move it around, and you can see that the line follows exactly where we want it to, showing us where our character is looking. But if I move way out, see that that line gets as long as it needs to be, and the segments uh, maintain their size. So we don't get little tiny segments here and really, really big segments here, but we always get a constant uh, segment size. So we'll put that back to default. And it looks like, if we turn that back off, it looks like we are finally done uh, with our head and neck. So we have display controls for the head and neck. Uh, we have controls for the head and neck. We have eye controls for display. We have eye controls, jaw controls. So next time we'll be uh, doing our left arm. And uh, hope to see you then. Thanks.